Good. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to UCT Africa Virtual ENT. I'm Dr. Agonofsky Bezos, and this morning I'll be presenting on branchial clefts type one. Just to like to acknowledge uh, Professor Pierre for sharing these case series, the case series with me to present. These are my disclosures. So I'll be presenting a, a three cases this morning um, on patients who, who have presented in, in different manners, but with the same diagnosis. Case one was a two-year-old boy with Treacher-Collins syndrome. He had features of left facial asymmetry with microtia, and he presented to the clinic with a, a history of a previous left um, preauricular sinus excision. On neck examination, there was a fistula present over his sternocline of mastoid muscle on the left. And on a previous CT, um, it was reported that there was no clear draining sinus into the external ear. He was subsequently booked for an MRI. Case two is a 13 month old baby boy who initially presented with bloody otorrhea a left pre and infraolicular swelling with a skin dimple in the mid mandibular area. And he initially presented to um, a GP. Uh, subsequently, an uh, ultrasound was booked. On ultrasound examination, the findings uh, were in keeping with uh, um, the appearance of a complicated first branchial cleft cyst. They described an oval-shaped, well-depicted echogenic mass lesion or collection um, in the left parotid gland with, without any vascularity. And there was a tract located measuring approximately four millimeters in diameter with a similar echogenicity as the parotid lesion, which was extending towards the visible skin dimple. He was subsequently booked for an MR, well, was referred to um, a professor and, and was subsequently booked for an MRI and CT scan. And on the day of imaging that was booked, um, the swelling was quite bad and um, he actually presented with an, with an infection. And the, the decision at that, at that point was to rather take him straight to theater and drain and scrub the cyst under general anesthetic without any further imaging. Furthermore, um, post-operatively and for the, for the past four years, he's had a continuously draining sinus with multiple courses of antibiotics and intermittent cycles of skin healing and breakdown. So he's now presented to specialist uh, pediatric ENT, He's a healthy five-year-old boy, despite um, this history, but complains of intermittent left otorrhea, and the source uh, can be located in the in, in from a pit just below the tragus, and it's associated with the draining fistula from the neck in the mid-mandibular region, um, which sub it has intermittent cycles of healing and and skin breakdown. And this is a third case of a patient who presented uh, just last week, uh, well, last week to Hrutiske, who was taken to theater by one of my colleagues, um, and she will be presenting this case at a later stage. So just in terms of an introduction, branchial cleft or branchial cleft cysts were first described by Asherson in 1832. It's an extremely rare congenital abnormality. It's um, but it is the second most common congenital neck mass. And in terms of type one um, branchial cleft cysts, it's it's so rare that it's reported in literature to be about one to four percent of all branchial anomalies. Um, in some in some recent more recent literature it goes up to about 25 percent however the one to four percent makes sense in because type 2 branchial clefts are the most common and they are reported to be um, as 95 percent of the branchial cleft cysts 
the incidence is estimated to be about one per million in, in the population per year. And why is it important? So in terms of patients presenting, um, every doctor or GP or ENT needs to really have a high index of suspicion for these lesions as they are frequently misdiagnosed and they have variable clinical presentations and anatomical find findings as, as shown in, in these previous three cases. Um, there's a high rate of recurrence uh, with those that are managed with incomplete excision and the identification of the entire tract during surgical treatment is of paramount importance to avoid further complications. So in terms of the principles of management, one needs to diagnose these early, um, control, control the infection um, prior to any form of surgical excision. And when surgery is planned, one needs to plan for complete excision with facial nerve preservation. So the widely, the most widely accepted theory for embryology is the incomplete obliteration of the branchial cleft during embryogenesis. Um, so, and according to the varying degrees of embryological closure, the lesion can present either as a sinus, a fistula, or a cyst. There's six pairs of branchial arches that, that appear during the fourth week of human embryological development. And these are separated from each other with by five pharyngeal pouches, internally by endoderm and externally by, um, and then five branchial clefts externally by ectoderm. And in the embryonic period at seven weeks, the arches fuse and the clefts obliterate. First, branchial cleft anomalies are due to incomplete fusion of the ventral portion of the first and second arches. During development, the closure time of the cleft is concurrent with the migration of the facial nerve and emergence of the developing parotid gland, which originates from the second branchial arch. And as such, first branchial arch clefts have a close relationship between these structures. As the obliteration of the cleft proceeds from ventral to dorsal, the lesions occur more often near the ear, the parotid gland, um, and up to the hyoid region. And just in terms of um, definitions and a reminder of, of, of basic terms, a sinus, a fistula, and a cyst, can, a branchial cleft can present as either three. Um, a sinus is a blind ending tract lined by granulation tissue leading from an epithelial surface down into the tissues and into the context of a, a branchial arch anomaly. It may connect with either the skin and would be termed a branchial cleft sinus or with the pharynx as a branchial pouch sinus. A fistula is a communication between two epithelialized surfaces and with regards to branchial arch anomalies, requires communication between a persistent pouch and cleft. And if no communication occurs with the inner mucosa or outer skin, then the trapped branchial arch remnant forms a cyst. So how do bran uh, type one branchial clefts present? So there's the age of pres presentation varies. They typically, typically present um, Cysts typically present in older children or young adults, um, whereas fistulas typically, typically present in infants and young children. Um, there's report, it's reported in the literature that there may be a, a, free, a female predominance and that they, they can also present bilaterally and this will be more associated with uh, children with um, syndromic um, presentation. There's an anatomical area um, described, it's, uh, and it's coined Poshet's triangle area, which is bounded superiorly by the external auditory canal, anteriorly by the mental region, and inferiorly by the hyoid bone, lying just anteriorly to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Um, and anatomically, first branchial cleft cysts or their sinus orifice are located in this triangle. Um, and um, how, how they can present is either a repeated swelling or just discharge in this area, 
um, a, a lateral neck swelling, um, and they can too have otological manifestations, um, which should raise your high index of suspicion. So any case of swelling or infection around the external ear, in terms of otorrhea, a partially or completely obstructed external ear canal, ear canal stenosis, um, give, should give you um, a high index of suspicion to exclude a branchial type one branchial cleft. Um, uh, and in terms of um, other ways of um, these patients presenting in the literature it reports, they can even present with features of cholesteatoma or otitis media. And so in terms of a, la a lateral neck lesion, and there's a broad differential, and this includes both adults and children. And in terms of congenital lesions, obviously a branchial cleft cyst would be um, at the top of your differential diagnosis, but a thyroglossal duct cyst is actually reported in the literature to be more common um, in children. Um, and your, your differential should also always include and exclude a hemangioma, um, a zincus diverticulum in an older in an older patient or a, plan, a plunging ranula, a laryngopiocel. In terms of vascular lesions, um, an aneurysm, a carotid body tumor, or vascular malformation needs to be excluded. Um, in terms of inflammatory lesions, an abscess or cold, an infected or a cold abscess um, or lymphadenopathy could still be still needs to be excluded in part of the differential. And any neoplastic lesion, whether it be malignancy um, of the oral cavity, pharynx or larynx, as well as any salivary um, gland tumors, which are benign or malignant. Um, and one should also always keep in mind ectopic tissue in terms of thyroid um, or salivary gland tissue. And going further into cystic masses, um, your differential would include branchial cysts, thyroglossal duct cysts, dermoid cysts, thyroid cysts, hydatid cysts, thymic cysts, parotid lymphoepithelial cysts, and um, necrotic lymph nodes. So when a patient like this presents, um, in terms of investigations, first and foremost, one if, if one should um, opt to do a final aspiration, um, if a patient presents with um, otological manifestations, one needs to have an audiogram um, and further imaging can be um, can be ordered, tailored, basically tailored according to the way that the patient presents. In terms of fine needle aspiration, um, going back to a paper um, which was published by our institution by um, Professor Fagan and colleagues, um, a fine needle aspiration is a simple, cheap, and quick diagnostic procedure to differentiate infective from benign and malignant head and neck masses, and also assists in directing management, um, which allows in re reducing surgical interventions and surgery-related morbidity and mortality. Um, it has a palpation guided fine needle aspiration has a very high sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy in about 90% of patients, and its non-diagnostic rates are, are less than 20%. Um, so in terms of a freehand palpation-guided fine needle aspiration, there's an 87% diagnostic yield. Um, so if there's a, a patient that presents with a solid, solid or cystic mass, um, one should um, put a small needle in and see and aspirate. In terms of what is aspirated, if a yellow pyrrolent turbulent fluid is aspirated, then one needs to keep at the top of their differential a branchial um, thyroglossal abscess or necrotic metastatic cancer at the top of their differential um, differentials. Um, if the fluid is clear or watery, then it's more in keeping with a lymphangioma or, or hydatid cyst. And if the if we look at the consistent consistency of the fluid aspirated if it's thick and white, then it's more in keeping with a dermoid cyst. And if it's yellow and syrupy like, then it's more in keeping with a ranula. Um, <clears throat> in terms of imaging, um, 
Ultrasound um, can assist with cyst identification and, and would be described or reported or visualized as a low echoic area on the ultrasound. Um, usually, uh, well-defined cystic masses is located within or deep to the parotid gland, um, and uh, the ultrasound will assist with determining the cystic characteristics. Um, in terms of a, a CT scan, one would be able to visualize or um, see a sharply circumscribed fluid density and a thin walled mass if a cyst is present. Um, and the wall thickness and enhancement is obviously going to be variable and tend to increase in size with, with history of recurrent infections. Um, and in terms of an MRI, if, if available, um, it can be used to assist with finer resolution. Um, in terms of T1 um, MRI scans, the uh, branchial cleft cyst will, will have varial signet dependent, uh, will be, it will de depend on protein content. Um, if there's a high protein content, it will have a high signal and low protein content will have a low signal. And, in t and T2 MRIs will have a high single signal. Um, one must keep in mind that imaging is, is there to aid us in, in assisting with diagnosing these um, lesions. However, there's no um, pathognomic uh, imaging features that are um, described. So one, the diagnosis really just depends on a very high index of suspicion and, and good anatomical and background knowledge of these typical lesions. Um, this is just an example of, uh, of an MRI that was done for case one, where on the capsule marker placed at the cutaneous opening in the left neck, um, one, it's reported that there's a subcutaneous tract extending from the level of the left, ex left external auditory meatus to the cutaneous opening and capsule marker in the left lower neck with a long tract um, and pos pos proximally the fistula in the posterior to the, the, the fistula is posterior to the left parotid gland. It doesn't have any communication with external auditory meatus and distally the tract is anterolateral, anterolateral to the left sternocleida mastoid muscle. Um, and this was in keeping with a, with a type one branchial cleft cyst. In terms of the subclassification of type 1 branchial cleft anomalies, um, in 1972, their work um, de uh, des described or classified these into two types based on clinical features and histopathology, um, where type 1 typically presents in adulthood. It's usually ectodermal. It presents in the preauricular area, often extending into the posterior crease, and it's usually anatomically lateral to the facial nerve, and it ends with uh, within the external auditory canal. Um, and it's uh, typically an, an cystic mass with pathology that shows squamous epithelium um, with no cartilage or skin adnexa, adnexa or cartilage remnants. And in types of uh, subclassification of a type one branchial cleft, type the type two um, work classification usually presents in childhood. It has mixed ectodermal or mesodermal components, and it usually presents at the angle of the mandible or submandibular region, passes through the parotid gland, and the tract ends in the cartilaginous external auditory canal, or can even extend to the upper face or neck. Um, and it's usually anatomically lateral or medial to the facial nerve and can present as a cyst, a sinus, or a fistula. And on uh, pathology, will show a squamous epithelium with skin adnexa or cartilage remnants. So in terms of surgical uh, management, preoperative goals should include um, that, in, uh, that the acute infection has resolved, um, uh, that we're aiming for definitive management, and as such, we aim for a complete excision. 
And this will avoid repeated surgery, scar formation, and fistula formation, along with uh, further complications. In terms of surgical pearls, um, you need to keep the tract intact. Um, there has been um, this described assistance that one can use a lacrimal probe, um, and even it's described in the literature to use a dye through the um, the sinus. However, this is quite um, controversial um, as it leaks into neighboring tissues and obscures your surgical area. And of, of course, if there is no sinus or fistula, it's in fact not helpful in a in a in a, in a cyst type lesion as well as a revision case um, where there's a lot of uh, scar tissue and adhesions. Um, one, um, so um, one should also be prepared to remove any parts of non-critical structures that are intimately related to the cyst or its tract, such as sections of the cartilaginous ear, external ear canal or the posterior mandible and preservation of the facial nerve. Um, is actually key, um, a key issue, and it's it's paramount um, in these surgeries. So a superficial parotidectomy approach um, with facial nerve identification um, is a common practice um, for first cleft anomalies given their location. However, um, the approach obviously needs to be tailored to the characteristics of each specific case, and these as um, these cases can present and uh, vary widely. In terms of the facial nerve and the anatomical variance of the tract and its relationship with the facial nerve, um, it has a variable course and can be divided into three types. Uh, the tract can either be superficial to the nerve deep to the nerve, or um, it can even uh, present between the branches of the nerve. So surgical approaches um, differ amongst these various types. And careful preoperative planning and protecting the facial nerve during a section of the tract is really essential. Um, so the variability um, and the relationship to the facial nerve and the tract is important and meticulous dissection should be um, should be done with every case. In any, any congenital anomaly, the facial nerve can also be anonymous um, since its development begins after um, that of the first branchial arch derivative and one should also keep that in mind. Um, and in terms of a superficial parotidectomy, one should always keep the, the classic landmarks in mind um, and these, these would include the posterior belly of the diagastric muscle, muscle. The nerve usually runs at the same depth below the skin surface um, and bisects the angle between the muscle and the styloid process. Um, the cartilage tragal pointer is the medial most pointed end of the cartilage of the external auditory meatus, and the nerve usually exits the foramen at about one centimeter deep and one centimeter inferior to this point. And in terms of the tympanomastoid suture line, it's, it's the most precise landmark for the facial nerve, um, and it leads medially and directly to the silomastoid foramen. And the styloid process is, is one of um, the, the, another important landmark um, as the facial nerve crosses the styloid process. So um, intraoperatively palpating the styloid process is a useful means to determine the depth and position of the facial nerve. Um, one should also keep in mind um, the branch of the occipital artery is a small branch um, commonly encountered just lateral to the nerve um, close to the styloid mastoid foramen. Um, and so if there's brisk arterial bleeding, one should, uh, one should be alerted to the proximity of the facial nerve in this region. In terms of pediatric cons um, considerations, um, it's advised that one, um, one should wait for both for in terms of anesthesia as well as development of the child for um, the child to be more than six months prior to um, preoperative planning. Um, and this is because uh, the branchial cleft 
normally noted in newborns or just after then, um, there's a still a very underdeveloped auricular cartilage and mastoid. Um, and so um, the operation should be deferred up to six months of age. Um, in young children, the facial nerve is more prone to injury as it lies more superficially. Um, and also the surgical landmarks are sometimes diff difficult um, to correctly locate and it may be somewhat difficult to find. So for, for wide um, and safe excision, um, one may need to opt uh, for modification in, in usual surgical methods. Um, and then also one should always keep in mind um, in these children with type one branchial cleft anomalies that they can also be um, a genesis of the parotid gland. In terms of approach, um, one needs to understand where the facial nerve is located and then can proceed with a surgical uh, with a surgical approach. If the facial nerve is superficial, one should follow the tract from, from the Poshet's triangle towards the external ear canal. And it is described um, that you then no longer need to, um, you know, um, follow the, or dissect the facial nerve any further as the, as the tract is superficial to it. Um, if the facial nerve is deep, then one should opt for a superficial parotidectomy with exposure of the facial nerve and, um, and, and its branches. And if the sinus tract goes between the branches of the facial nerve, um, this is difficult. Um, one should opt for a superficial parotidectomy approach with, with quite wide exposure um, and good patience and identification and preservation of the facial nerve is um, of paramount importance. Um, and just in terms of a, a case report, um, this, this case report described, uh, it's a case series by um, recent, well published in 2016 and the objectives of this paper was presenting five anatomic um, five anatomic variations of the first branchial cleft anomalies and describing how they presented and evaluated and and the surgical approaches that was um, was was followed that was followed through with um, uh, and in terms of conclusions of this paper it it just uh, it just puts forward the importance that. They have a very variable presentation and that complete surgical excision is, is quite challenging. And so careful, careful preoperative planning and recognition of atypical variants during surgery is quite essential um, and important to keep in mind. All these cases had preoperative imaging um, demonst demonstrating the tract to follow. Um, four of the surgical cases uh, we had a superficial parotidectomy with identification of the facial nerve, um, and one revealed an aberrant facial nerve um, intraoperatively. And in the case where the tract was found to the level into the angle of the mandible, um, this actually it actually terminated as a mandibular cyst. Um, this required an on-block excision that included the lateral cortex of the mandible. Uh, so, and, and in terms of complications, so if the, if the, the tract is not completely excised, um, recurrence rate is high, um, as well as infections um, post-operatively, specifically if, it, if it's not completely excised, and facial nerve palsy has been reported in 2 to 5% of the literature um, with these cases. So it is quite important to keep the facial nerve um, in the back of your, or in, in front of of your mind whilst performing these uh, surgeries. In conclusion, uh, first branchial cleft anomalies are rare, but they do present and we need to keep them in mind. So we need a high index of suspicion for these cases. They should be referred um, to an otolaryngologist in terms of further management. Um, and it should be the, the differential uh, diagnosis of a patient whenever a patient presents with the swelling around the external ear or upper lateral neck. 
The surgeon should be aware of the anatomical variants and the surgical approach should be based on physical exam, imaging and the clinical course. Um, in terms of the anatomical variants, one should also be able to excite or be prepared to excise any additional tissue um, that including scar tissues and adjacent non-critical structures. Um, but one needs to always uh, keep the, the facial nerve in mind, identify it, um, safe identification of the facial nerve in all cases is important. Um, and just, you, yes, the sinus tract may be superficial, but even then um, one should, should keep the facial, identify and keep the facial nerve in mind. These are my references. Thank you. They, uh, any, any comments? Um, thanks, Aggie. That was great. Um, I'm not sure if Tashneem is there. Um, if she wants to comment, but I, I have to go and intubate Duna now, and I don't want to miss the opportunity for her pig. So I just wanted to comment on one thing. Sorry, my video is on. But um, what I did want to say was that this, this actual type of branchial sinus, the type one, is intimately involved in the lateral neck and ear. And I think that's something that um, is quite different to the other branchial sinuses. So it's important to bear that in mind. And so a lot of people like what happened with your first child, where they basically just scarified the outside um, uh, opening. And this child now has half a closed fistula and the proximal end is still open and draining. And we don't even know if there's another component to that fistula going deep to the parotid. So we'll see that only on the MRI we do after that. So just for people who are non-ENT, especially in the pediatric field, to not intervene until a pediatric ENT has seen the patient or an autologist has seen the patient, because they generally have much more of an idea of the anatomy in that area, because sometimes you need to get into the middle ear. So someone like Tashneem would be best suited to manage all these children, because she can actually go into the parotid if need be. So thanks. Thanks for highlighting this. And I'm so glad we got like four or five of these kids all milling around now. Maybe somebody would do a review. <laughs> thanks, Aggie. Thanks, Prof. Any other questions or comments? Um, thanks, Aggie. It was a nice presentation. I just wanted, I, I don't know if you did clarify, but just from a registrar point of view, um, did you mention how you distinguish from a preauricular cyst or sinus and a type 1 branchial anomaly? Um, so as so I went into the basic, well, the, the, the anatomy of it, the difference between a, a sinus or fistula, where sinus is usually a blind ending tract. Um, but, no, sorry, I mean, just I don't think you understand the question. So the difference between a preauricular sinus, which is a common congenital anomaly, which we see all the time, and a type 1 branchial cleft anomaly, you understand the question. What is the how do they differ in clinical presentation? How do you distinguish between the two? Uh, so I would probably say that you know, in terms of a preauricular sinus, uh, it will it it will um the the child won't present with um otorrhea, you'd need to do an, oto an otoscopy and make sure that there's no uh, connection in, into the external auditory canal. Um, they wouldn't necessarily have a history of, like I said, a leaking ear um, or other associated symptoms. Um, the preauricular sinus would be um, confined to the place, uh, to, to the area of, of the preauricular area, um, whereas with a, with a type 1 branchial cleft, um, you would you would it would typically present with other otological manifestations in terms of the external auditory canal where it may connect. I don't know if that answers the question. 
you know, so it's a bit more simple than that. So, that, I mean, obviously, bear in mind you, you don't have to have ontological manifestations or internal fistula with the type one branchial anomaly. 